Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session, a webinar about the value of international cooperation and um, funding opportunities. I'm Julia Pagel, I'm the Secretary General of NEMO for uh, the ones who are new in this NEMO European Museum Conference. This is the last day, but we have quite many sessions in front of us. Before I give the floor to our moderator, Ludwig Kuiper, I would like to make uh, you familiar with uh, some of the technical details uh, for this webinar. Your camera will always be turned off. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat in the Zoom function. Uh, and we also want to um, uh, inform you that all uh, the webinar will be recorded so you can access it later on our channels. So now, without further ado, I'm giving the floor to Ludovic Kuiper, who is uh, managing or uh, moderating the session together with Margarita Sani, with uh, Jenny Siung and Pierre Johamari. Thank you, Julia. Uh, good morning, uh, participants. Welcome to this webinar about the um, value of international cooperations for museums, a toolkit to get started. Today, we are going to talk about international cooperation. The background of this webinar is that in 2019, Nemo ordered a valuable study with an analysis of museums' participation in the four main EU funding programs from 2014 to 2018. Nemo did this to get a full picture of which museums and from which countries profited from EU funding in order to ensure the best possible access for museums to their future EU funding programs starting in 2021. The outcome of this study was um, very insightful, but also slightly worrying. Out of the cultural institutions that profited from the Creative Europe program, the main program from the EU, only 6% were museums. And for the other three programs, Erasmus Plus, Horizon 2020, and Europe for Citizens, the percentage of the share of museums was even less than 1%. Therefore, the working group at Focacy drew the conclusion that museums uh, do not use all the EU resources that are there. Following this study, the working group at Focacy started to think of instruments to improve museums' knowledge about international cooperation and access to the EU funding. We, as a working group, um, for which I'm the chair, that's why I'm also uh, referring to it, we came up with the idea of a toolkit providing museums with a map, how to navigate the international cooperation and EU program landscape and help museums get access to the resources that are there. Um, that's what brings us together in this webinar. Um, Margarita Zani has done an impressive job in creating a toolkit with practical tips, but also a lot of valuable background information. She will start with a presentation on the EU toolkit. If you have questions, feel free to submit them in the chat. We will have time for a Q&A straight after Margarita's presentations. I will be your moderator. Then we will have two cases from Pirio and Jenny, who will share their experiences with international cooperation and EU funding and share their lessons learned. Now I want to introduce the speakers a little bit more in detail. First of all, Margarita Sani works at the Institute of Cultural Heritage of the region Emilia Romagna, where she's in charge of international projects in the museum field. In the last 20 years, she has designed and managed several EU funded projects, in particular on museum education, lifelong learning, and intercultural dialogue. She's an active member of many professional museum associations and networks, among which NEMO, ICOM, and the European Museum Academy. Then our next speaker is Pirio Hamari. She is an experienced heritage professional who has been working with heritage management and policy related questions at the Finnish Heritage Agency since 2001. She graduated in archaeology in 1996 and even received a PhD in 2019 and initially worked in the archaeological fieldwork and site management as a researcher. In 2001, she moved on to digital heritage management and policy development as a senior advisor. Then our last speaker of this session will be Jenny Sayan, and she is head of education in the Chester Beatty in Dublin. She commenced her post at the Chester Beatty first 
as the Westchester BD um, first education officer in 2000 and has devel developed the multi the first multi and intercultural learning program in an Irish museum. Her work involves engaging with the Islamic, East Asian, North African, East Asian and European collections of the museum. Devising numerous programs, including intercultural projects for schools, cultural festivals, and creating links with local multi ethnic communities. With no further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Margarita for her presentation. Thank you very much, Lodveig. Um, I will start sharing my screen right away. but I should be able to share the screen. And at the moment it tells me I can't. Uh, so the NEMO office can go ahead and use the presentation I sent or else uh, please let me be able to share my screen. Right. So here we go, the value of international cooperation for European museums, a toolkit to get started. That's what the advocacy group of NEMO asked me to do and to prepare. And this is what I've been working on in the last uh, weeks, months. Um, of course, as Ludwig said, this starts, uh, the, the initiative starts from this publication, which uh, NEMO um, commissioned in uh, 2019 to see how uh, museums were faring in the uh, what it is called the, the EU jungle, the jungle of European programs. And indeed, as Ludwig um, was saying, there is a lot that can be done and improved to encourage museums to um, to take part in European projects because there is a value and I'm, I'm very fond of international cooperation which has given to me so much personally and professionally. Um, so definitely um, there is a lot that can be done and, and the objective of the toolkit uh, is to encourage museums to, to start these international cooperation projects. Um, the, the toolkit will be ready, I guess, if not at the end of this year, very early in 2021. 20, uh, it is uh, finished and it's going now to the designer, so it should be So I'm giving you a preview of what you will be able to see and read very soon. After an introduction on the benefits for museums uh, of, of international cooperation projects, we go into the toolkit as such, into the step-by-step -step guide of what one should do. Um, and let's look at these areas together. First of all, the organizational check. Um, well, first of all, the questions that one should ask oneself, like, uh, do I already have contacts? Do I have a network? Do I belong to an organization which is active at European or international level? Are there events in my area that could create some uh, useful connections, like festivals, that, like the European Euro, uh, of Capital, uh, or, or, or some other uh, twinning, uh, maybe opportunities, and so on? But the organizational check in, in the sense of also doing an internal self-evaluation of, of how your organization is ready and willing to undertake an international cooperation project. That's also very important. So does my organization have uh, an international strategy? Uh, what are our mission and values? And, and when it comes to the funding program, uh, do they match with this uh, international funding program and, and so on? Also, personally, this is very important for me to underline because in my own experience, uh, the, the governance that of my organization, which changed at some point, really uh, changed also my way of working internationally. Um, I really had a moment uh, in time, a period in time in which I was given uh, the possibility to explore and to produce and to be creative in the European arena. And then with the new governance, with new director, board of directors and so on, my this, this freedom of, of experiment and, and, and try out uh, different uh, international cooperation uh, models was a bit limited. Might change again, but please check that if 
if you want to embark on, on one of these initiatives, you have the, the organization behind you, but then, because then it is up to the decision makers to decide whether you can go ahead or not. Second element, uh, building a network. This is absolutely a prerequisite for uh, international cooperation projects, not only because you need partners in your project, but also because you need to develop your project with your partners in, in order for it to be successful, to be shared and to really be successful. So, of course, now we are in a context, NEMO, which, which really facilitates and allows to, to have these sort of uh, contacts and, and to, to have an exchange with, with colleagues. But of course, other networks are equally important. In the, in the toolkit, you will find one testimonial of a maritime museum, an Italian maritime museum, which belongs to inter the International um, Association of Maritime Museums. And surely this exchange with, with, with peers, with like-minded uh, organizations and individuals helps a lot. Uh, although I must say that uh, international projects are also uh, very good to try out uh, cooperation with non-museum organizations with adult education organizations, with tech companies, with NGOs, with a variety of partners that otherwise you would not meet. So also thinking out of the box is very important. How do one build, uh, how does one build a, a network or how does one enter into a network? There are very many ways. And as I keep repeating uh, in, in this context, start small. So maybe start even with a, with a study visit to some place with a travel grant that you can obtain either through various organizations that are available or also using the, the, the NEMO grants to, to go and, uh, and be part of a learning exchange or a study visit. So um, again, building a network, having a network is, is very important. And then developing the project idea. I wish it was really like this, that at some point one light bulb gets off in your head. It's not like that. There is a lot of preparatory work before the right project idea comes around. Because again, as I said already, it is not your own idea, your own as an individual, and not even your own as an organization. Because in international cooperation, what you need to be aware of is that what is important for you might not be important for other organizations that will be your partners. And therefore, also the project idea needs to be developed in partnership and needs to have an international value. This is, um, this is what will be asked of you when you fill in the application, one of the applications maybe. Um, what is the international value of your project? Why does it need to be funded internationally and not nationally or regionally or locally? So developing a project idea for me is all something like this and this refers to a real uh, life experience in 2006 i think it was at the end of, of an emo conference that i had breakfast with some slovenian colleagues of the slovenian museums association and we talked about different things and then they came up with the fact that um, there was a new piece of legislation being passed on volunteering in the country. And because I knew that we were interested in, in the topic, my organization was, and other organizations I knew in different countries were, we put together a project on uh, volunteering, and which was then called VOC, Volunteering in Cultural Heritage, was funded and, and, and produced, produced a handbook and, and so on. So uh, developing a project idea also starts during coffee breaks or at breakfast time. Okay, and looking for funds. Okay, this is very important. When you have the bright project idea, you've shared it with possible partners, then you, you, you're looking for funds. And in the toolkit, I deal with different kinds of funding sources, both uh, direct and indirect. So the structural funds, I mean, they cannot, they, they are not dealt in uh, in detail, but they're mentioned, so you can follow up. And then, of course, the, the direct um, funds that we all know, the, the, the programs that we all know that, that fund cultural Europe for, uh, for citizens, um, Horizon 2020, which will 
then be called starting in 2021, Horizon for Europe, Creative Europe, and so on. Uh, so these, these projects, these, these programs, and also other programs are uh, briefly described in the toolkit. The main thing that I would like to underline here is that Europe doesn't fund your project. Europe funds its own policies and programs to your projects. So that is very important. I mean, no matter how relevant for you and for your partners your project is, it is only relevant in as long as it is relevant for the European Union, because the European Union sets its priorities, its policies, and when your project matches those priorities and policies, then it is a good project that can be funded. Um, again, uh, the EU co-funds projects, so the, it's, it's important to, uh, to find that uh, matching uh, funding source. Um, and uh, we, we have in the toolkit some interesting um, suggestions by some countries which created a fund to co-fund uh, approved European projects. So um, also in this case, uh, looking for funds, um, my, my advice is to start small um, and, to, and to get acquainted with um, projects, uh, with, with programs, and, and I'm focusing now on European programs, by uh, maybe being a, a minor partner in a partnership, in a consortium, because you really learn a lot uh, by, by, you know, by being there, not having maybe a relevant role or a demanding role, but getting to know how things work. And, and, and I personally, when I started in, in 1999, uh, my organization was a, a partner in a project which was very badly managed. I'm, I'm not mentioning the program, not mentioning the project or the person, but was very badly managed. I learned a lot. That's where I started. Uh, I learned a lot of how not to manage a project. So, uh, you know, even if you enter, even if you're a bit doubtful, uh, but enter the partnership and see how things go. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and you can also learn a lot from other people's mistakes. Okay. Very quickly now from the project idea to the project application, how we love those forms, how we love those application forms with all those questions. So, um, of course, as I was saying, it's important to know the priorities of the program that you're going for. And when you start working on an application, uh, you really need to start thinking systematically. So this is what is required of you, um, being aware that uh, um, the application, if the project, if your project is funded, becomes your contract. In, in some uh, EU programs, you can still negotiate. There are still uh, there is a maybe a two-stage uh, process, but in many uh, programs like Creative Europe, you, what you write is what you bind yourself to. So be care very careful that what you offer is realistic, is doable, is manageable, and so on. So uh, the project application, as I said, requires a, a systematic way of thinking. The uh, EU programs um, force you to think uh, in detail how your project is going to be action by action, starting from the goals and then detailing the goals into actions, in sub actions and so on. And all these actions need to be costed. So in the toolkit, you will find some tools that will help you think systematically. But again, referring to my own personal experience, when I started writing applications, I was not aware of these tools and I was successful because I simply followed the application form questions and they force you to think systematically and to think ahead and to plan forward. So it's good to be aware of those, of those tools, but don't get scared if they are a bit complex uh, because even without knowing them, you can be successful in following the, 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 the application questions. Uh, writing the proposal, okay, writing the proposal uh, means, of course, again, having looked at all the, <clears throat> at the project in, in, in all its details, answering all the questions, 
and doing, in a, doing it in a way which is simple, straightforward, understandable, because the application and the proposal is what the evaluator will look at and assess. And uh, so it is important to that, that the application is consistent, that it is comprehensible, and so on. In the toolkit, we also have tips from the evaluator, some tips that an evaluator of uh, Creative Europe uh, projects and Erasmus Plus uh, uh, projects provided and those are very good uh, to be looked at because you have to put yourselves also in the shoes of the evaluator. Not all evaluators know your field so it's important to be very clear and, and, and so on. Writing a proposal can be uh, a collective exercise or a solo exercise and when I mean a solo exercise I don't only mean a the exercise of one person, uh, but maybe of one organization, because it is important to bring together all the components, the budget in itself needs uh, uh, some, some expertise. And so um, even if it is a solo exercise, nevertheless, it has to be shared with the partners because when the project is approved, when it has to be carried out, every partner needs to feel that that project belongs to him or her. So this sense of ownership is very important. And you only achieve that if you take all the ideas of, and, and needs and expectations of your partners into consideration. So if the project is funded, what is next? Now the fun part, right? The meetings, the conferences, the study uh, uh, visits and so on. In the, um, in the toolkit, we have uh, tips for the project leader uh, when the project is funded and tips for the project partners. My main suggestion is be very clear, invest, well, this is uh, true for every phase of, uh, of an international project, um, invest very much in the planning phase, that is before the project is, is funded, invest very much in the initial phase. So if you are the, the project leader, invest very much in the kickoff meeting, first time when people get together, make it also fun, make it a, a, a good, uh, interesting opportunity to meet colleagues, but plan it very carefully uh, so that everyone knows exactly what he or she is meant to do in the following two, three, or four years. So uh, being very clear and, and, uh, um, and, and having a clear idea of what everybody's tasks is, uh, is important. Okay, and for project partners, don't be afraid to ask. So the other sections of the toolkit um, tells you how, where to find support in the different um, contact points of the, of the different uh, projects, of the different programs. The role of the museums association, they can also be very supportive in, in uh, um, advising about opportunities for funding in liaising also with the um, national contact points. Then the resources, we have resources, uh, websites and, and bibliography, the glossary, a short glossary. And then we have two appendixes. One is, I call it now, maybe I don't know whether it will be called hyperlinks in the end. But anyway, it provides links to the parts that are not detailed in the toolkit because the toolkit needs to be an agile in order to be, to be manageable and, and readable. But these... Um, other parts where you find more detailed information is in the hyperlinks. And then there is this very valuable part for me, which is called the challenges, personal benefits and lessons learned. And where we have some testimonials like Pirio, like Jenny, who uh, tell about their own experience, their lessons learned, what they did uh, uh, wrong or right and how they would do it live differently. So indeed the, the toolkit is a bit a sort of like um, the scaffolding, but the, the lessons learned and the challenges this Appendix B is really the flesh and what is interesting. So to conclude, uh, I think that, the, I mean, this is me, right, in, in a tight rope walking exercise, because to me, uh, European projects are a, a tight rope walking exercise in the sense that you have to juggle between different um, objectives, uh, the objectives of your own organization and the priorities uh, of the funding uh, program, uh, the different, the different uh, cultural backgrounds and organizational cultures of your partners. 
and also uh, what you write in the in the project application and how the project develops because every project is um, is a, a, an organic uh, say uh, endeavor and so can develop in a way that is unexpected. In this case, uh, you should know that, of course, what you have written is binding, but there is a margin of flexibility that unexpected events are, uh, if explained, possible, and you should take advantage of them because um, also from, from new, um, new possibilities and new suggestions of partners, things that you had not uh, considered, a uh, lot of good things can follow. So this is from me. Thank you very much. And I give it back to you, Lord Weig. Thank you, Margarita, for this very um, uh, lively and um, very clear uh, walkthrough through the different parts of the toolbox. Um, I'm seeing, I think that your, your story was so very clear that there are not yet um, uh, questions. Um, also looking at the time, I, I suggest that it's a good move that we straight away go to Pirio to hear her case first. And if people uh, in the meantime have questions still, you can put them in the chats and we can uh, um, um, di discuss them later. So I would love now to give the floor to Pirio. Thank you, Lodewijk, and also thanks to Margarita for, uh, for uh, a clear presentation. I'm, I'm sure this uh, uh, toolkit will uh, become uh, a very useful tool for us to in the future. Uh, now I would like to ask you uh, if you can see my presentation. I hope so. It looks promising from my part. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, following Margarita, uh, uh, I will now uh, make a short uh, uh, introduction of how we, de we, we develop one project for the uh, Creative uh, Europe funding. Uh, it's an applicant experience, uh, and I should warn you beforehand that we are the co uh, coordinating partner. So this uh, is a, a, a description of, of, of a partner that uh, uh, perhaps has done most work in order to uh, uh, make this project happen. But don't be alarmed by this. It's, it's a description of that. But there are many other ways of joining a project besides uh, being the lead partner. Uh, but I will share our experience with you and, and we can hopefully then also discuss parts of it. So what I'm talking about is uh, a project called Moi Museums of Impact. Moi in Finnish means hello. That's, that's a really nice uh, thing for us uh, always to remind people of. Uh, and we are a project that has, been, has now received funding from Creative Europe program. Uh, we are running uh, until uh, November 2022. Uh, and like many projects uh, currently, there's a slight COVID extension to the activities, uh, but our project has not overly suffered uh, uh, from, uh, from this impact. Uh, uh, the only uh, uh, downside is that we have not been able to organize the physical meetings we are looking for, we're looking for, but these have been turned into virtual meetings. Uh, we are a partnership of 11 partners across eight countries uh, across Europe. And uh, as you see from the number of partners and also the cooperation too, we are a large cooperation project from the Creative Europe program. And what we aim to do is uh, to produce a European museum self-evaluation framework for museums of all sizes and types, with the help of which museums can increase their impact in society. So it's a tool for museums uh, to work with their activities and, and to think about their mission and, and the way their activities are organized uh, in order to achieve impact. Uh, and this uh, uh, aim and this, this framework we will create through a series of workshops for partners working together uh, we organize a number of open stakeholder forums uh, for the museum communities across different countries in Europe to uh, help us formulate the new framework. 
uh, uh, when we have a draft framework, we will organize a number of pilots in different museums across Europe uh, to test in real life how, how uh, applicable uh, what we have been thinking is to the, uh, to the uh, activities of the museums or, or how practical the model is to be used and uh, uh, fine-tune it after these pilots through another series of workshops and stakeholder forums and finally publish the models and disseminate information about that. It's quite a straightforward uh, work program, uh, but the, of course our aim is, is, is to create something that has European added value and specifically for that a European cooperation project is a very good way of working for us. Uh, I'm also advertising the next session where, where I will be go into more detail about the project itself and there will be uh, links in the, at the end of this presentation where you can uh, read more about MOI and the project itself. But uh, following Margarita's uh, presentation, I wanted to take you through our application process since we are an example of, of, of uh, of failing and then coming back and being successful uh, and we thought together that this might also give you an idea that this is also possible to do and uh, here you see the path we follow through the uh, development of the project uh, of course uh, museum evaluation is something that uh, we have been working with nationally for already several years in Finland and we knew already that other places other countries and other actors in, in Europe were working with the same kinds of or similar or uh, 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 connected uh, ways of uh, working. Uh, and we had networks uh, through which we could uh, start building uh, an idea about uh, European cooperation. But this, uh, uh, the first uh, ideas, our first concept paper was written in October 2016. And all throughout 2017, we then developed, I see a typo in the first uh, arrow, but uh, don't mind that. Uh, we, we contacted uh, officially more partners in order to be able to leave the application uh, in January 2018. And all through the uh, autumn of 2017, we continued discussion with prospective partners, uh, first uh, through emails. But there was also a possibility to organize a pre-submission partner meeting. And this was actually done in, co in connection with the uh, NEMO conference organized uh, in Ghent in October 2017. So networking uh, activities like NEMO is organizing were an essential part of our success in, in submitting uh, this application. I've also put in uh, that the contact with our national Creative Europe desk uh, was very useful and I strongly recommend everybody who's thinking about applying contacting their uh, uh, national desk because they have a lot of expertise and they are usually very happy to help you onwards. That's why they exist and get funded. So at our application date was in January 2018. Uh, the evaluation process takes its time uh, 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 and eventually we got the results back in uh, uh, July uh, uh, 2018. Unfortunately, it was a rejection of the first application. I put also in the, in the uh, scoring, so we scored 74 points out of 100 uh, when the threshold uh, for successful application was 81. So this was the first point that we were quite close in being successful as an applicant. Of course, you know, these are very competitive funding and it's not easy to get through, but we knew it was not completely uh, in the woods, uh, the, the application. Uh, uh, in between these two application phases, I put two uh, main things that uh, made us decide to go forward with the reapplication. And the first one was a, a very positive feedback from our partners for all the work done and immediate uh, 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 questions about the possibility of reapplying and also joining the application. 
And of course, we had an innate desire to work on this topic on a European level. So, so this was also our, this, uh, we had our own motivation to, to uh, try, think about trying to do this another time. So uh, we took the decision to reapply in our organization uh, uh, quite soon after the, uh, we received information about the first rejection. Uh, we started uh, 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 an official dialogue with uh, with our partners and 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 luckily uh, or or because of the partnership was already with, uh, really strong it was possible to reapply with most of the existing partners or with only some uh, replacements or 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 dropouts so we were basically the same uh, consortium applying again uh, the second application date was in in uh, december 2018 and we got an acceptance letter in in uh, july uh, 2019 there's all again a typo this time uh, reaching 81 points out of 100 with the threshold of being 80 so uh, not by much but enough to be a successful uh, project so, as this was a reapplication, uh, of course, uh, uh, in addition to having to decide uh, whether it's worth to reapply, we needed to make um, needed to be very careful uh, about adjusting the project in a way that would make it more successful next time. So, where did we fail? Uh, you receive uh, 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 an evaluation report uh, for for both successful and uh, not successful proposals and of course they are a very good source for you to understand what exactly was seen as not so uh, uh, well developed in the proposal so failing is also an opportunity to improve uh, we could see uh, because it's divided like Margarita said it's very structural and we could see that there was were some specific parts where our our proposal not was not very successful specifically the relevance, uh, which means for Creative Europe, how well the project matches the objectives of the call. And uh, we did a lot of work with this and we managed to raise the scores we uh, got from relevance from 19 to 26. So, so uh, 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 the feedback from, from the evaluators was really helpful in helping us to do this. There were, there were other things as well. Uh, uh, and the remedies we did that we uh, fixed things that were ob obviously wrong. We explained things better that were misunderstood. For example, one of the evaluators was expecting artistic fees or artistic direction for the pilots, uh, which was clearly a misunderstanding what what we were talking talking about the pilots. And, and this was then our job to do a better explanation with. And for some comments, we thought that, uh, okay, they have their views and we have our views and we feel quite strongly about that. Margarita was already ma making a mention that projects can well be developed in breakfast tables and, uh, and dinners. So we feel strongly that good food uh, makes better projects. So uh, catering costs are not uh, uh, something extra, but they are key to the activities. Well, this is this this is uh, because this is a cooperation project where we bring together a lot of stakeholders. So this was the explanation why there are, and a lot of no mention, not specified, not sufficiently detailed. So things just needed to be better explained. And I'm probably nearing the end of what I time what time I have allotted, but I have gathered here some key points that are learning outcomes from the process itself. Uh, many of these or, or all of these are in the, in the uh, toolkit uh, and no need to go into detail, but I would just re-emphasize what Margarita was saying that uh, this is not about what you think is the key in the project, it's about what the objectives of the call expect you to do. And uh, even though we might not like this approach from the European uh, 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 Commission or, or, or the programs. Uh, that's how they uh, uh, they uh, categorize uh, projects, and uh, uh, and that's what you need to match. So it's very very important that your application explains or matches the uh, objectives of the core. 
And the other thing, there are uh, uh, things here, uh, uh, several things uh, I, I just wanted to emphasize uh, the, uh, uh, the importance of having a good consortium. So use your existing networks and, and, and as an experienced applicant on, and also uh, from the other side of the desk, I would emphasize that pay attention to not only, not only to the relevance part, the beef of your presentation, but please make sure that all the extra bits are also in order. You, you need to have a good communication and dissemination plan. You need to explain your risk management. You need to explain your management processes. You need to explain how you will ensure quality. You need to explain who is doing what. All these uh, uh, bits that might be uh, left undeveloped because you are focusing on the key activities but they are very important for, for you to gain the extra points in the presentation, in, in the application in order to reach the threshold above which you will be funded. And I just wanted to emphasize in the, in the end that uh, it's not an easy process, uh, but it's absolutely worth it. Uh, there are so many benefits for working on a European level. And I would uh, encourage you also to, uh, perhaps not start with a whole project of your own, but, but just to put your feet in, in between the door and join an existing project, find the connections and, and uh, spread your wings in a smaller way. But, but, but uh, doing European cooperation is, has, has also given me a lot of uh, personal uh, uh, advancement and, and also benefits for my organization. And uh, uh, just some contact details. Uh, if you want to know more, you can contact me or our project, and you can also find the Moi Museums of Impact project on Facebook and, and on, on internet. And if I finish my presentation, just uh, to show that the consortium we have is mostly represented in the image. This was the first and the only physical meeting we have been able to organize so far, far Margarita was talking about the importance of kickoff meetings, and this is, was our kickoff meeting in Helsinki uh, in January 2019, uh, 2020. Sorry, and uh, I think I've I've said everything I can in the time allotted to me, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Perio. Um, that was again a very um, insightful uh, case that you shared with us. Even you were so honest also to tell that the project proposal was first at a certain moment rejected and then you improved the plan and then it got um, um, awarded in the end. That's I think very interesting to also hear that uh, people can learn from that. Um, I want to go straight away to our next speaker, which is Jenny, um, also looking a little bit at the time. So Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Ludwig. I'm just going to share my screen, except my PowerPoint. I'm sorry, would I be able to ask Nemo to upload my PowerPoint? Is that possible? Yeah, give me a minute. And Thank I'll you. I'm sorry about that. I, I have it on my desktop. It's just not appearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody in NEMO for all of this, organizing this, as well as my colleagues on the panel. Um, my name is Jenny Seung. I'm from the Chester Beatty. It's an art library and museum in Dublin. And um, I suppose the benefits of working with international partners has been incredibly useful for uh, the practice of uh, museum education and learning, particularly in my organization, because when we um, relocated from the suburbs to the city centre and opened in January to or February 2000, there was very little elsewhere in terms of my peer organizations working with an Islamic East Asian and European collection. Um, so when we won the European Museum of the Year in 2002, that opened a door into the world of European networks and European projects. Because I met Margarita 
in 2003 at an EU funded workshop in Italy. And I met her again the following year. And then she invited me, our, our organization, to be part of a European project. I initially said no because I didn't understand it. And then I did a U turn and said, yes, I think we should join it. And I suppose the, if, if you look at the next slide, This is just to give you an idea of, of our collection, um, because it comprises of, as I said, Islamic, East Asian and European rare books, religious objects, decorative materials, but it's unique within the island of Ireland. Um, and for most Irish people, these collections would have been very unfamiliar to them, as well as the cultures. And I suppose the benefits of being part of a European project is I was able to meet other organizations and colleagues who are working in a similar um, area, such as the collection similar to ours. And they also had experience of de devising learning programs, which again, wouldn't have been prevalent in Ireland back um, around, you know, first uh, from 2000 to 2010 or thereabouts. That, that just gives you a sense that um, in a small country with a small cluster of museums, um, which tend to look at Irish national history, this doesn't really fit into that remit. However, we are an Irish cultural institution. We do have a national remit, but we are very international as well in our standing because of the nature of the collections. Can we just look at uh, the next slide, please? And I suppose in terms of where we've come since then is how do museums compete with the outside world? Um, I think the last time I stepped out of uh, Ireland before COVID-19, I went to Icon Kyoto in, in September 2019, and I had the fortune, uh, I was able to look at um, Team Lab, which is a digital immersive experience. Um, some of you around, the, uh, um, around Europe may have had the, the fortune of, of having Team Lab come to your country or come to your museum, but they are high tech, incredibly innovative um, and I would imagine incredibly expensive. And how do museums on a low budget meet the needs of people who are, our audiences who are tech savvy and are looking for that immersive experience? Uh, that I suppose comes from um, the ability to be flexible, but also the ability to be creative. And if we look at the next slide, because I think I come from the world of the old formula. Um, and I think a lot of my peers would have this traditional trajectory of going to school, graduating from college, and climbing up the ladder in your career. But I don't believe that works anymore. And this became very apparent in a, a project we were involved in with um, IBC and Margarita's organization called the Learning Museum. And we were looking at different elements of learning um, for museum practitioners. And we wanted to continue working together as partners. But we, we realized that, okay, Margarita was going to go off and do other initiatives. We decided to take our experience from collaborating in European projects and start looking at how do museums take on, on, on the other side, um, the maker mindset because the maker mindset uh, sprung out of the crash, the economic crash um, in 2008. And they just started tinkering and experimenting and using their hands and using their, their ideas and trying and experimenting how to make things out of pretty much basic tools. Um, in a subgroup, I know Margarita talked about meeting colleagues for coffee, we stood on corners in the streets of Bologna trying to work out where do we take this project next? How do we continue the synergy that we've developed through the Learning Museum? And we came up with the idea that, well, look, look at the makers, look at the, what they're doing. How can we learn from them? And this came about through our, we took a, the chance and we made our own grant application called, uh, for a project called the Creative Museum. And we took the maker mindset and applied it to how do we upskill museum practitioners with a maker mindset. Can you go to the next slide, please? And so the Creative Museum um, came about as a result of 
these conversations that took place on the streets of Bologna. And the grant application went in in 2013. And from 2014 onwards, uh, we successfully acquired Erasmus Plus funding to upskill and train museum professionals, but also collaborate and work with our local maker community. And that was a three year initiative. And then we got an extension of another year to, to continue the work of the Creative Museum with the Making Museum project. Can you look at the next slide, please. And as a result, we've successfully acquired further funding to continue this idea and concept of bringing creativity and critical thinking um, and experimentation to a new project that started in 2019 and will finish in 2021 called the Creative School, but bring it from the museum professionals and practitioners and makers to teachers and students. Because I suppose as a, a, a fallout of um, the economic crash, we're now expected to be far more multifaceted. We're expected to be far more creative and event and inventive as well as collaborative. And those skills we can share with young people who are coming out of the education system and are going into the workforce because those expectations are also being applied to young people today as well. We'll go to the next slide, please. So this is a kind of, this is the uh, trajectory from the Learning Museum project um, from 2010 to 2013. And that moved over to the Creative Museum project, uh, which went from 2014 to 2016. And then that, that short turnaround making museum project and from that, you know, the, the benefits, and I think uh, Marguerite and Piro have, have both reflected the benefits of these European projects is the networking, learning from peers, the exchange of good practice and risk taking. Um, because I suppose when you are working with partners, you are taking a risk through working collaboratively because you're, you're stepping out of your own organization where you're very familiar with its own structures and way of practice and working with people who may not come from your world, such as I mentioned, the makers. And we also collaborated with science centers. I've never worked with a science center until the Creative Museum project. So there was a great exchange of new ideas. And experimenting is something that I really do believe in um, without feeling afraid or hesitant in experimenting and trying things out. Can we go to the next slide, please. And this, I suppose, is our biggest experiment uh, in the Chester Beatty, is uh, as part of the legacy of the Creative and Making Museum project, we started to take on um, makers as part of a residency. Most museums will take on an artist in residency. They might have an, a studio allocated for an artist to interpret or respond to the collection. We took on a maker, and a maker is somebody who, as I said, uh, uses DIY, do it yourself, uh, comes from a techie engineering background, uh, computer design, digital design, and so on and so forth. And through our partners, the uh, Finnish Museums Association, they were able to put us in contact with a maker who came to Dublin in 2016. Is it 2016? Gosh, yes. And uh, had a, he had an MA in digital mapping or digital projection and interpreted our collections and he mapped out, I don't know if you can see in that slide, um, the very top one on our atrium wall, he mapped out the projection of our images uh, using a Raspberry Pi. And a Raspberry Pi is a, a homemade computer for around 40 euro. And again, that's the beauty about working with makers is they, they work from the bottom up um, and things may not always be as expensive as I showed with Team Lab. Um, immersive experience in, in Tokyo, which is definitely not 40 euro. It costs a lot more. So we had our first projection mapping and projection mapping um, in an Irish museum, because there are other commercial uh, events that do use projection mapping on buildings of images or lights and lights display. There's a light festival in Milan. There's a digital projection festival in uh, Latvia. So it is very familiar, but for museums, it's very expensive. Um, and we also did two follow up sessions with two more makers and residencies through the San Jose twinning, which um, is a twinning between the city of San Jose and Dublin. And we were able to tap into funding. So Margarita mentioned funding as well. And we tapped into that funding in 2017 and 2019 with two makers, the first being Corinne Bolcada Takara 
who responded to the art of Japanese knot making inspired by Celtic knots. And she came over and did a week of workshops with our teens. And then last year we worked with an Iranian American artist called Pantia Karimi, and she responded to our Persian medieval scientific manuscripts and worked with teens for a week as well. Can you just go to the next slide, please? And um, I suppose the benefits for our own organization is we're embedding a practice of exchange with other European partners, but it's bringing in the non-museum practitioners to work in collaboration with our organization. I think that's really, really important to, to bring in outsiders who may not be familiar with um, our organization, uh, the nature of our organization, but also we I get to know um, the creative, innovative thinking of makers who we, we're not familiar with. It's trying something new and testing and experimenting. And it's okay for planning and carrying out activities to be messy. I'm saying messy because it's not perfect. Be prepared to test and learn and fail and try again without getting into trouble. Um, can I just, there's a, we can play the clip of the projection mapping. So that should play. There's a play button underneath the image. And that's to give you a sense of the projection mapping. I, personally think it's one of the most beautiful things I've seen in our museum um, engagement with our public. And then the last slide, I think. So the two, just to give you an idea of makers. Um, so the left is Kareen, Kareen's not making workshops we do with the teens. And Pantea on the right, this is a, we went out to our local maker space, Botog, um, where we were able to just explore local maker practice and have an exchange of ideas. And the last slide, and that's to say thank you because we've got to wrap up now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, for a very insightful um, uh, narrative uh, with a lot of experiences shared. And it's also nice to see that in the comments, also people are um, uh, mentioning, for example, Jo Sunderland, that she can put into words how much experience has been gained from EU projects and cooperation, also reduced since 2007. So it's nice to hear people recognize the story and the experiences that you share. Um, we have to wrap up soon. It's time for one question that was there for Pirio, and that's the question, is the mentioned European self-evaluation framework somehow connected to the ISO key indicators for museums? Uh, that's a question to you, Pio. Maybe you can quickly answer that one. Yes, I, I, the very quick answer is no, it's not connected. Uh, the ISO, ISO, we know, of course, about the ISO, ISO indicators, but they are indicators. And Museums of Impact Evaluation Frameworks a Framework is not an indicator framework. It doesn't assess your performance. So this is the basic uh, difference. Uh, but we are positioning the MOI project uh, in conjunction with all these kinds of, uh, of uh, previous, uh, for example, registration uh, or accreditation systems in addition to these kinds of, of, uh, of uh, indicator frameworks. Thank you. Then we have time for one last question to Jenny. Do you have experience of Horizon EU projects written, developed and coordinated by graduating students? as capstone projects proposing to a network of museums and international cooperation. In other words, do you think that EU international development programs have to be pushed and developed into only internationally, it, on, correction, only internally by experienced museum professional? Gosh, that, that's a tricky question. Um, I have never myself applied for a Horizon EU project because it tends to lie in the world of third level university researchers and departments. Um, we've been invited to participate, but I believe the competition is very stiff. I also believe the lead in time takes up to around two years to develop uh, before you submit your application. So it's something I, we haven't uh, taken on ourselves, but we've had a little taste of the grant application by participating in applications and they seem to be quite unwieldy. But they tend to be used by the third level university sector. That's all I can say from my own experience. I don't know if that answers um, Novella's question. Thank you, Jenny. I think that's um, a great moment to wrap up this whole session. 
I want to uh, thank all three of you, Margarita, Pirio, and Jenny, for your contributions on behalf of all the participants. All the participants, thank you so much for joining in the session and being involved and reading the questions. Um, I would like now to give the floor back to Julia. Hello, everybody. And I would actually like to thank all four of you, including Lodewijk and Margarita, Jenny, and Pirio. And maybe to uh, this uh, question, we are now uh, presenting.